Scotland is a small nation that's exerted an outsized influence on the modern world, an influence ranging from politics and economics to university disciplines, the arts, even my field, the study of literature. But Scotland also bears a fascinating history within Britain, a history of influence and resistance and self-reflection. And suddenly from being a barren and empty culture in the 1970s, Scotland seemed to be a culture overflowing with wealth, cultural wealth. Our guest today is Professor Cairns Craig, the Glucksman Chair of Irish and Scottish Studies at the University of Aberdeen. Over a long and distinguished career, Professor Craig has written widely about Scottish literature, culture, and history. He's the author, most recently, of The Wealth of the Nation, Scotland, Culture, and Independence, published in 2018 by Edinburgh University Press. Professor Craig talked with us about what Scotland's rich history can teach us about the modern world and about the role of the arts in forming our identities, culturally and even nationally. I'm Matthew Wickman, chair of the Humanities Center and host of this podcast, and now our conversation with Professor Craig. Karen Craig, it is such a privilege to have you uh, join us today. Um, I will say that this is a, uh, a selfish interest of mine to have you on. Um, I uh, cherish our conversations and want to have a chance to do this today uh, for this uh, podcast. Anyway, thank you very much for being here uh, to talk about us today. Nice to see you again to hear you thank you yeah, likewise you know even if only across zoom uh it is this way of seeing is not quite as nice as uh, sitting in a pub in edinburgh but it will do it's a close second not not that close but still um we'll be talking uh, mostly about some points you raise in uh you really uh, i think powerful uh, 2018 book the wealth of the nation um a book that unfolds layers of uh, scotland's rich history its influence in the modern world it's central yet historically fraught position within Britain and the lessons that Scotland can teach us about the importance of the arts uh, to cultural, civic, even national well-being. Uh, my first question is a kind of a, a simple one. It's, it's, you know, you've written many books uh, in your distinguished career. Um, why did you write this one at this time? Well, I, the nature of this book changed uh, over the course of its writing because it was supposed to be my book for the 2014 referendum oh. debate <laughs> uh, on Scotland's independence, but it never got finished in time for that. And therefore, it had to be reshaped to address the consequences of the failure of the 2014 referendum. And it was also, a, in a way, trying to address uh, where I'd come from in my own study of Scottish literature, because not having actually studied Scottish literature as a student or as a graduate student, I had to teach myself Scottish literature. Uh, and uh, typical Scottish autodidact in that <laughs> respect. And I acquired a sense of Scottish literature, which was uh, generally accepted, I think, in Scotland, in the 1970s and 1980s, which was that Scotland was basically a failed culture in the 19th century. And then when people discovered the Scottish Enlightenment, that Scotland had had a great intellectual past, but it was all downhill from 1746 onwards. And so this book was really an attempt to rethink what the wealth of the nation has been since the Enlightenment through to the current political state of Scotland, and to try to give a positive account of what had been achieved in Scottish culture in that period, when mostly it is treated as second-rate, insignificant, irrelevant to our understanding of uh, either modern Britain or the modern world in general. That is a, uh, a history, a set of stories, uh, intellectual history, cultural history, literary history that you tell, I think, so well. Um, 
and have over many books and articles uh, in your career. And, and I think this book in particular, The Wealth of the Nation, uh, is, is just an outstanding uh, illustration of that kind of history. Um, let's, I, I want to ask you in a minute about, about why you had not studied Scottish literature, where that whole idea of national failure was playing into, uh, you know, sort of cultural life in the 1970s, et cetera. But I wonder if we can begin by talking about the, the Scottish Enlightenment. And I've got a question in a moment that will sound like a trick question. You'll know exactly where I'm going with it. Uh, to set up the question, might be able to remind listeners, right, that uh, the Enlightenment's typically taken to represent achievements ex- enabled by an expanded use of reason during the 18th century. Uh, so that you find new developments in modern science, civil society, economics, politics, uh, disciplinary specialization, universities, etc. Scotland, as you point out, has a really rich Enlightenment tradition. Um, uh, and you're, in your book, in fact, The Wealth of the Nation, uh, it alludes to Adam Smith's seminal 1776 economic treatise, The Wealth of Nations. Um, and Smith is one of the most, well, one of the many important figures we associate with the Scottish Enlightenment. Here's my uh, so-called trick question, okay? Um, Cairns, where was the Scottish Enlightenment? <laughs> well, if, if you had been... Uh, following discussion of the Scottish Enlightenment in the 1960s and early 1970s, uh, it was only in Edinburgh or close by to Edinburgh that the Scottish Enlightenment was basically David Hume when he was in Edinburgh, though a lot of the time, of course, he wasn't, and Adam Smith, who was in Kirkcaldy, but visiting Edinburgh uh, on a fairly regular basis. And that uh, there were only two important figures in the Scottish Enlightenment, Smith and Hume, Hume and Smith, depending <laughs> on which way around you want to place their importance. And uh, nothing else counted as the Scottish Enlightenment. And what happened in the 1980s was that people began to discover that there were uh, not just there was not just an Edinburgh Enlightenment, there was a Glasgow Enlightenment, there was an Aberdeen Enlightenment, there was an Enlightenment that ran through all of the improving estates across the Lowlands and the Highlands, and there was an Enlightenment that was led by those who were considered to be the anti-enlightened, who were the ministers of the Church of Scotland. Uh, Mostly the moderates could be incorporated easily, but lots of the ones who weren't so moderate couldn't be incorporated easily into the notion of the Enlightenment. And so the Scottish Enlightenment is really uh, a way in which a certain group of historians tried to figure Scotland as part of a European uh, story of Enlightenment and, as you say, of rationality. But in fact, neither Hume nor Smith believed in rationality or in any of the major features that are generally attributed to the Enlightenment. In fact, for Hume, uh, it's the passions that are important and it's the study of the passions that the philosopher and the historian have to be engaged with because reason will not explain anything. It, It totally fails. And for Smith too, He ends up in his uh, account of uh, astronomy saying that however powerful Newton's uh, theories are, we have to remember they're just imagination and that all the supposed truths of science are imaginary constructions, which we take to be real, but which in fact are fictions. And so both Smith and Hume challenge what is con- usually considered to be a central element in the European Enlightenment, the, uh, the centrality of rationality. Which is such a fascinating point, I think, about the Scottish Enlightenment. And because, you know, in a schematic history, right, when we kind of tell the simple version of, of kind of the progress of ideas, you kind of move from rationality in the Enlightenment to discussions of the passions, the emotions, imagination with the Romantic period in the at the end of the 18th century and into the 19th century. But as you point out, those were the passions, imagination, et cetera, central to the study of the Enlightenment, well, to study in Scotland uh, from very early on in the 18th century, um, which is is, uh, 
I think, a really interesting uh, feature, uh, the Enlightenment. It begins in Scotland by talking about precisely those things that supposedly didn't happen until after the Enlightenment. So, so I guess I could have asked you the question, when was the Scottish Enlightenment? Uh, and the answer is before other Enlightenments or in a strange relation to them. One point you make in the book... Well, also I, the question... Yes. Again, just to interrupt, Matt. No, yes. The question here is how uh, badly Scotland fits into our normal model of how the 18th century turns into the 19th century. Because the assumption is you have an Enlightenment and it's followed by Romanticism. And that Scotland, as it were, jettisons enlightenment in order to become a romantic nation. But of course, the great romantic text, a uh, Macpherson's Ossian, yeah. is published in 1760, alongside the works, major works of the Enlightenment thinkers. And indeed, Macpherson was sent to the Highlands to find this material by a group of Edinburgh literati. So romanticism is actually side by side with or within a uh, enlightenment in Scotland rather than something which uh, enlightenment precedes and is and is obliterated by. That's right. And as a scholar, I always I've always found that to be uh, such rich ground for study, uh, that kind of thing. And I, I you know, that you mentioned McPherson, the, those who don't know about uh, James Ossian McPherson or the Ossian texts that McPherson partly found, partly invented, partly translated. Uh, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's an incredibly um, uh, rich, uh, powerful, uh, provocative story. Um, and, 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 and I always loved myself studying uh, these things uh, in the 18th century in Scotland. I was trained as an 18th centuryist myself, you know, sort of British and then later Scottish 18th centuryist. Um, and it's a rich part of my own study. One point you make in your book is that there was a profound influence coming out of Scotland across the world as a function of Scottish migration uh, during the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and you make the point that migration was not all or even mostly a function of economic hardship. People weren't leaving Scotland because things were dire in the nation. Uh, in many cases, quite the contrary. It was, Scotland was part of a very rich empire, uh, British empire. Um, I wonder if you could uh, explain a little bit about, about uh, some places where Enlightenment traveled outside Scotland. There's maybe take a couple of instances where Enlightenment shows up elsewhere outside of Scotland. Well, I think... Uh the thing you've got to as it were, take on board here, and which I think most historians have failed to take on board traditionally, is that the union between Scotland and England was not a union between two nations. I mean, implicitly it was, but effectively it was a union between two empires. One, the actually existing English colonial territories in North America, and the other, the Scottish desire for empire, which had come to an end with the Darien uh, expedition of the late 1690s. And so Union provided the Scots with the opportunity of having an empire. And the, the empire they wanted, although it's always called British, because the Scots were part of it, was actually a Scottish empire rather than a British empire. Because what they did was that having, as it were, retained their Presbyterian culture in the terms of the Union, because the Church of Scotland retained its position in Scotland, wherever they went, they had to set up a church. To have a church, you had to have a minister. To have a minister, you had to have a college where a minister could be trained. To have a church and a minister, you then needed a congregation that could read the Bible and be educated enough to understand a Presbyterian uh, religious polity. Therefore, you needed schools. And uh, as well as the schools, you needed universities. So wherever the Scots went from the 17th century, uh, when they were interlopers into the English colonies, they built institutions around their Presbyterianism. And those institutions were a fundamentally educational institutions designed to promote a Presbyterian Calvinist culture uh, wherever they had established themselves. 
So uh, the earliest colleges in uh, the United States, William and Mary in the 1690s, uh, the College of New Jersey, which turned into Princeton. These are all Scottish foundations. Right. And the curricula in them follow the curricula of the Scottish universities. So what they teach is philosophy, both natural philosophy and moral philosophy. And they don't teach Latin and Greek, essentially. They teach rhetoric. They teach modern uh, vernacular language and how it works. And so the curricula of lots of the universities in the United States and later in Canada were actually modelled on the curricula of Edinburgh and Glasgow and even Aberdeen University. And um, therefore, uh, when the Scottish Enlightenment was taking place, those places were the direct repositories of the ideas of the Scottish Enlightenment, both in the sense that people actually went from Scotland, taking the ideas of uh, the Enlightenment with them, and also because the book trade, which was publishing all these works in Scotland, provided the books for the colleges and universities of North America, often through Dublin, rather than directly, they were pirated, but they arrived in uh, North America. And so the standard textbooks of uh, North American colleges through the 18th and into the 19th centuries were the works of Thomas Reed, Dougald Stewart, and so on. And uh, therefore there was a kind of Scottish Enlightenment infrastructure, which retained its Scottishness, despite the fact that it was at such a distance from Scotland itself. Right. And, and which couldn't have happened if the Scots had adopted Anglicanism. Right, which is, yeah. English would have wished them to do. <laughs> of course, <laughs> uh, which is, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an amazing set of stories uh, you tell about that. In fact, you use a term um, that, uh, you know, one of the, the ways that Scotland's uh, influence in the modern world has been charted by historians in, you know, last couple decades is the term Scottish diaspora, kind of borrowing from the idea of Jewish diaspora, dispersion, a dispersion of Scots around the globe. You employ a different term from uh, diaspora in your book, um, which is, it, do I pronounce this correctly, Zenitea? Yeah. Is that is that right? Um, well, that's roughly right. My Greek is not good enough to tell you whether that's exactly right. Okay. Zenitea is <laughs> okay. how I pronounce it. Okay, that works. Uh, you know, X-E-N-I-T-E-I-A, uh, Zenitea. Uh, can you explain the difference between uh, those terms, diaspora and Zenitea, and, and why you chose the latter to describe uh, Scottish migratory patterns in the 18th and 19th centuries? Well, people have started. People started using diaspora a lot about both the Irish and the Scots in the latter part of the twentieth century, and I think uh, this produces a, a kind of confusion about the model that you're using to describe the movement of peoples, because a diaspora uh, from Jewish tradition and Greek tradition are ba basically people who are forced to move by conflict and violence and by being expelled from their own territory. Uh, whereas Zenitea are Zenitaeans are people who choose to move, who don't regret leaving their own country because they're taking it with them and rebuilding it in a new place. So the Zenitaeans are all those Greeks who went across the Mediterranean and built cities based on Greek architecture back in Athens and try to recreate an Athenian atmosphere in their, in the culture, in the place where they had landed. And so Zenitaeans are uh, people who do not suffer from the sense of being victims in the way that diaspora uh, people do. They are people who go, as it were, with confidence that they take values with them that they can reestablish and that those re-established values will create a context in which their own, their previous culture can flourish again. And that's why I chose Zenitaeans, uh, because it seemed to me the Scots were not a diaspora in the way that you could argue the Irish were a diaspora, because so many of them were forced to leave because of the famine 
in the 1840s, a very small proportion of Scots were forced to leave, mostly those in the Highlands during the Highland Clearances. But most of the Scots who went, went willingly to exploit the opportunities that empire provided. This is such a, uh, a, a fascinating story. And these opportunities that empire provided are, you know, were, were important economically, as you put it, important for the uh, promulgation of knowledge. Empire, you know, in our 21st century is a sketchy term. It, it, you know, we don't like uh, the idea of what empire designates in terms of forced colonization, for example, forced conversions. The thing I've always, well, one thing among many I've loved about uh, Scotland's empire and Scotland's enlightenment is the sense of self-critique built into it. Um, so, for example, you talk about the way in which in the, the work of the Scottish novelist Walter Scott, a uh, famous you know, 19th century novelist, so influential, that you find, that you find in Scott's historical fiction a, a kind of an ambivalence toward the logic of progress. Uh, you point out that uh, Scott's fiction addresses on one side history as progress, but on the other side, history as a feeling of tragic loss. Um, what do you think, so, so what made the Scots as reflective as they were about the implications of the enlightenment they brought? Well, in part, uh, because Scotland in the 18th century was profoundly divided between a traditional Highland culture and a developing modern industrial culture in the lowlands. So that you quite literally could walk from a modern industrial world to Karen Ironworks in Falkirk. And in a day's walk, be in a what seemed to be an ancient tribal society of an entirely different kind. And uh, some of the major figures of the uh, Scottish Enlightenment, like Adam Ferguson, argued that although there was improvement when you move from one to the other, there was also loss. And you lost many of the virtues that belonged to that older form of society. Which meant that I think uh, people like Walter Scott had this deep ambiv ambivalence about progress and the sense that, yes, there was progress, but the progress was built on destruction and loss. And um, that, uh, therefore, you had to show both sides of that equation in your works of fiction, if you were to be honest to the nature of the history that you were describing. And uh, it used to be, I think, that Walter Scott was uh, interpreted as being a, an old Tory who only liked the past. But in fact, of course, his house was the first, almost the first house in Scotland to have gas lighting. Mm. He wasn't mm -hmm. someone who was locked into the past. He was actually using modern technology in his own environment. And what his novels constantly emphasize is the necessity of progress. You're not gonna be able to stop the changes that are going on in society, but the tragedy that this involves for those who end up on the wrong side of the divide between the progressive and the ancient uh, in that transformation. And Scott always goes back to the ancient in order to show how it's being destroyed by the progressive and that therefore the progressive is not necessarily as good as we might think it is. It's a, it's, it's, the, your book is filled with these kinds of stories and nuances. Um, it's it's a, a, a fascinating uh, account that you give of all of this. I wonder if we can, you, on the basis of what you said there and, and my comment here, uh, maybe shift to the story of Scotland's relationship with its own past. Um, this is an important theme in much of your work, and this book, The Wealth of the Nation, uh, in particular. Um, you write that the remarkable outpouring of creative energy in Scotland in the early 20th century, a period often referred to as the Scottish Renaissance or the Second Renaissance, uh, with all kinds of exciting developments in literature and painting and theater and more, 
uh, was unable to draw on the energy of its own past, the Scottish past. Um, what do you mean by that? Why was that so? What happened to the Scottish, to this, this sense of Scottish history and thought, all this richness? What happened in the early 20th century? Where, where did it go? Well, I think you've got to put these two stories together. I mean, in the latter part of the 19th century, Scotland was not, a, as it were, a little isolated country to the north of England. It was the centre of an empire, Yes, an empire where uh, Scots could go to teach in universities, to work in medical schools, to found botanic gardens, and so on. And the uh, power of uh, Scotland's culture was constantly being reinforced by its reproduction in all these places around the world. And the great symbols of this are the uh, centenary celebrations for Robert Burns and then the centenary celebrations for Walter Scott. These were ce celebrated across the glo globe on the assumption that Scottish culture represented some kind of cosmopolitan virtue that could be applied and used anywhere. A man's a man for all that. Mm. And that uh, uh, Scots were not just there, as it were, as one little community within a lot of other communities, they were central to this whole imperial vision, which they had helped to construct through the schools, universities, medical schools, etc. And therefore, in, by 1910, 1912, there was this huge sense of a Scottish imperial mission, which involved quite literally a mission, a Christian mission, that reached out across the whole world and that made Scotland and its religion enormously important in places like India and Korea, uh, as well as in the settler colonies of Australia and New Zealand and so on. And uh, the celebrations for the Burns centenary were actually advertised as a kind of global celebration that they would link up the cities all across the world where these celebrations were going on. And uh, so what you had in late 19th century Scotland was an enormously confident and powerful cultural infrastructure, which reflected back on the importance of Scotland to the rest of the world. Now, uh, the, that Scottish empire collapses a lot more quickly than the British empire did, because partly because of its very success in founding all these various institutions uh, in, the, in the imperial territories, because the First World War provides places like Canada and Australia and New Zealand with their own sense of their independent national identity and their sense of no longer being uh, tied to the British Empire in the way that they had been. And therefore you get this interesting transition where uh, Scottish intellectuals who move at the, in the period after the First World War, move taking with them Scottish cultural values, but they become the founders of national uh, cultural formations in the territories to move, they move to. So John Anderson goes from Edinburgh to Sydney and takes with him the idealist, stoke realist philosophy that had been developing in Edinburgh. But he turns it into an Australian philosophy and it becomes an independent Australian entity. Robert Morrison MacIver goes to Toronto and then moves from Toronto to Columbia and in Columbia establishes what becomes one of the main strands of American Sociology. At Columbia University, yeah. Yeah, at Columbia. And they, therefore they, as it were, ceased to be representatives of a Scottish culture, as their predecessors had been, and become uh, integral to the re-establishment, or to the initial establishment, in many cases, of a new cultural formation in the national territory in which they're working. And with that, uh, 
the Scottish uh, Empire loses all its energy. And that energy turns into a kind of um, a sense that everything that had happened from uh, 1746 through to 1914 had been a waste of time. Hmm. It ended up with nothing. Hmm. And that Scotland was now, as it were, reduced from this huge imperial construct to this tiny little marginal society struggling against the huge numbers of deaths in the First World War and the consequences for Scotland's industrial uh, society of the loss of production uh, post the First World War and into the Depression. And therefore it becomes a very fragmentary and uh, self-alienated kind of society. I think that's what I suggested. Yeah, it, 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 and, yeah. And, and yeah, and I find that persuasive in the book. And it's actually this takes us, I think, to uh, maybe talk about what you've seen over the span of your career. You mentioned you didn't study Scottish literature when you were a, an undergraduate student or a postgraduate student, um, but you certainly have taught a lot of it uh, as a professor um, at Edinburgh and now at Aberdeen uh, University. Um, I may want to get talk about uh, just four key dates and their significance and what you've seen kind of change uh, in Scotland's understanding of its own uh, history in the space of your career. These dates, 1979 uh, and then 1997, right? Those are such different <laughs> things, right? And then 2014 and 2016, again, another wrinkle in there. Um, so the shift from uh, 1979 and the failed devolution referendum to 1997, the successful one, uh, what happened? I mean, that's 18 years. It's not a long time, Karen, but, but, but that's a pretty big Felt change. Felt like a long time at the time. <laughs> I'll bet it did. <laughs> I'll bet it did. But a massive change occurred there. What happened? Well, uh, this is where we have to be careful. The 79 uh, referendum was not failed. It was It succeeded. It was 52-48 in favour of yeah, good point. Scottish Assembly. Yes. It only failed because the Westminster government insisted that there had to be a 60% vote in favour right. before it would go ahead. And uh, they were using a, 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 an electoral vote that was five years out of date. And no one could ever have got 60% because all the dead people voted no. <laughs> so, um, but the the question I think uh, uh, that 1979 posed was why did so many people choose not to vote at all? It was only 30 percent, roughly, for yes, and 30 percent for no, and 30 percent who didn't vote, leaving aside the ones who couldn't and who were, uh, as it were, only a uh, ghosts on the electoral roll. And um, I think for lots of us at that time, uh, what this suggested was precisely that people were still locked into this version of Scottishness, which had dominated the 1920s and 30s, uh, that the Scottish past was irrelevant, it had no meaning for a modern Scotland, and that uh, there was no point wasting time on actually delving into that past. And uh, also that a large proportion of the Scottish population were still uh, deeply committed to the British state for which they had fought in the Second World War, or their relatives had fought in the Second World War. And they could not see Scotland as being different from the rest of the UK in ways that justified anything that meant having a Scottish Assembly, a Scottish Parliament, or least of all, independence. And I think for those of us who had struggled our way through that 1979 experience, um, I, at the time, lots of people said, I'm leaving. <laughs> There's no point staying here. Uh, and those of us who stayed felt that we had to do things to change the way in which Scotland's past was perceived. 
And uh, so uh, that led me uh, personally into a publishing career uh, because I helped set up and run Kinkrastus magazine, which was created in order to provide a space to discuss these things in the 1980s. And, um, uh, and it led me on to uh, my four volume history of Scottish literature. Uh, 1987. Because it seemed to me that people simply weren't aware of what was there in the Scottish past or of its possible value to a contemporary Scotland. And I, I, I mean, I'm giving this from my own perspective, but there were dozens of things that were established in the early 1980s that were the direct result of people's desire to see something happen culturally that would show Scots the value of their own culture. For instance, a, there was a thing called the Scottish Poetry Library. That's right. Now, why would you want a library for poetry when you already have a national library with all the books of poetry and you have an Edinburgh City Library and you have local libraries? The idea of the Scottish Poetry Library was that it would be a repository of the virtues of the Scottish tradition of poetry writing, and that the place would, as it were, manifest something that you couldn't just discover by walking into an ordinary library and picking a book of poetry off the shelf. So my interpretation of um, this period is that it's a period of enormous cultural renewal in Scotland, when a whole range of people got involved in rediscovering the Scottish past and reinvigorating it in its relevance to the Scottish present. And uh, that's why I chose the image from Callum Colvin yeah. uh, as the yeah. book cover, Here it is too, because yeah. um, Callum Colvin seemed to me precisely the kind of artist who had taken, as it were, the cliched versions of the Scottish past and turned them into something interesting in terms of contemporary art. And uh, significantly, I think, through the 1980s and 1990s, we saw the publication uh, of a couple of histories of Scottish literature, of a history of Scottish music, a history of the Scots language, a, a history of Scottish art. And suddenly from being a barren and empty culture in the 1970s, Scotland seemed to be a culture overflowing with wealth, cultural wealth. Uh, it helped, perhaps, that there was also some economic wealth coming from the North Sea at the time. <laughs> yeah. but, the, uh, but the cultural wealth uh, was suddenly enormous and that that spilled over into the cultural production by a whole new generation of Scottish writers, James Kelman, Alistair Gray, Liz Lockhead, who were presenting a Scotland that had never been there in literature okay. previously, and a whole new generation of Scottish artists who were creating extraordinarily interesting works of art and almost, as it were, uh, symbolically, it was in that period that we discovered uh, the outcome of Ian Hamilton Finlay's enormous efforts to produce an art garden uh, uh, at Stony Path, uh, just south of Edinburgh. And that became, as it were, a symbol of how you could take an apparently barren landscape that had only been used for sheep uh, for 250 years and turn it into a place that was both uh, artistically interesting, but also a uh, beautiful in terms of its use of the natural world. And by the mid to late 1990s, I think people had an, a totally different version of the Scottish past than what we'd inherited in the 1970s. Absolutely. I know when I, when I uh, 
was a graduate student in the 1990s, for example. I mean, there were all these histories you're talking about, you know, histories of Scottish music and Scottish culture and Scottish literature. They were they were somewhat newly minted. They had been at, you know, less than two decades, often less than a couple of years. And it seemed to be a place that was full of, of riches. Um, uh, so that I, the, 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 the lesson being taught in universities by the time that I was a postgraduate student from when you were a postgraduate student was very, very different. Um, and you make a point, uh, we have about, I don't know, maybe three, four minutes left, um, that, uh, that if, if politics in Scotland had failed or occasionally failed, uh, artists, poets, writers felt that art must take its place. And um, I wonder if that's a lesson uh, that you think, the importance of the arts to a sense of a country's political and economic and national uh, identity or its political well-being, uh, economic well-being. Is that a lesson that's generalizable to other places in Scotland? Is that a version, you know, of, of uh, a Scottish uh, influence in the modern world? Or is it really particular to Scotland given things that are unique to that country? That there could be such a, uh, a crossover between the riches, the wealth of a nation culturally to manifestations politically? Well, this is a point that I've made, but which has been disputed by various people who say, you know, the Scottish Parliament actually happened because of politics, not because of culture. I, but I doubt if it would have happened at all if it hadn't been for the upsurge in cultural confidence that was produced through the 1980s and 1990s. And there's a book just come out by Scott Hames on the literary politics of Scottish devolution, Yes, uh, which takes precisely the opposite line to this. Um, but what I would point out to Scott Hames is that this didn't just affect literature and high art. It affected popular music, it affected right. Uh, television. Uh, who would ever have thought that you would have an Edinburgh detective or a Glasgow detective in television series that were being shown around the world? Uh, you'd never have believed it could happen in right. the 1960s. And, uh, and equally, the enormous success of uh, Scottish uh, popular music uh, in the 1980s and 1990s meant that People didn't need to be reading uh, serious literature in order to acquire the sense of the relevance of Scotland's past to its present. Uh, when Runrig uh, sang, you take the high road and I'll take the low road, an old Jacobite song, <laughs> they're making the past into a contemporary uh, affect that right. can inspire people's sense of who they are and what they can do in the world. And so there may have been a very particular kind of significance here because we went, as it were, from a vacuum, the void, uh, to something incredibly uh, creative and developmental. But I'm sure that this is uh, also something that has been happening and, uh, and Scotland may be in, in step with this, in fact, in lots of what we used to call post-colonial countries, mm -hmm. where the building of your own cultural infrastructure is crucial to the development of a political in infrastructure and to the sense of the nation's potentialities in the world. So the effort, as it were, to use culture as a means of a integration and advertisement for the virtues of your culture, I think is something that's been going on a lot. Absolutely. Uh, across the world. I, see, I agree with that. I, I, I think, for example, that the impact of, in, in, in America, for example, the impact of novelists like Toni Morrison on um, perceptions of uh, racial injustice, for example, uh, have been, I mean, so manifestly uh, evident uh, that I, I, I like your argument that um, that that culture has influenced politics. I will say I, I, I like Scott Hames very much. He and I were at an MLA conference uh, uh, where Liz Lockhead uh, was talking. 
And she talked about 1979, and she hadn't thought much about, she was even younger and hadn't thought much about politics. But uh, then when the, the devolu- when the referendum did not pass, she thought afterwards, well, why didn't I think more about that? Why didn't I, can't, what, what was wrong with me? And, and, and so she began giving a lot more energy to that topic in her poetry, which of course impacted you know, other people and how they thought about it too. So I think that her story, for example, would be one where it was very clearly the case. And, and she's been very influential, not just in other writers in Scotland, but on the public. She's very much a poet uh, for the public. Karen, it is such a privilege to talk to you. Uh, I, I, you've been such an enormous influence on my own uh, work, my own thinking as a scholar. Um, I have immense admiration for you, uh, for what you've done. Um, and, and I'm very grateful uh, that you took time uh, to talk uh, to me today on this podcast. I wish you uh, continued success uh, for whatever your current projects are. Uh, I will read them with great interest. And hopefully, uh, once the pandemic is over, I can see you again uh, in more hospitable uh, surroundings, i.e. someplace in Edinburgh or Aberdeen. <laughs> that would be lovely. Nice to have talked to you. Thanks, Karen. Hope we can see you soon. Look forward to it. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the BYU Humanity Center podcast. Think clearly, act well, appreciate life. This podcast is sponsored by the Humanity Center and the College of Humanities at Brigham Young University and is produced and edited by Brooke Brown and Sam Jacob. The music for this podcast is composed by Ethan Wickman and is performed by the Soli Chamber Orchestra and Nicholas Phillips on Albany Records. I'm Matthew Wickman, founding director of the BYU Humanities Center and host of this podcast. If you're interested in other episodes of this podcast or want to know more about the BYU Humanities Center, check out our website at humanitiescenter.byu.edu. Thanks again for listening.